All right. So yeah, as usual, let's start with the brief recap of what we've done last time. Uh, so last time we started discussing the Maxwell equations in the in the matter in different materials. <clears throat> and we started with the formulation of Maxwell equations in the free space as we derived them. Um, and we decided to consider different materials depending on their uh, nature, right? Like uh, concentration of uh, charge, concentration of charges, either dielectrics or conductors. And we also quickly discuss the uh, magnets, right? Materials with a finite magnetic, magnetic response. So we started with the dielectrics. <coughs> dielectrics, like perfect dielectrics have no free charges, right? So if no free charges, then no uh, conduction currents. And also, and only polarization currents and displacement currents are possible. <coughs> right, so dielectrics, no free charges. The way we discuss, we describe these dielectrics with these materials, uh, we introduce the uh, concept of polarization. And the concept of polarization is introduced through the uh, quantity known as the dipole moment. So the dipole moment is the, it describes the deformation uh, of the, of the electron, electronic orbitals in each of the atoms that consist, constitute the, the material, right? And uh, of course, this is vector vector quantity uh, because this deformation gets the uh, direction. Okay, so and and also different deformation, different polarization leads to different uh, well response, and uh, so this value gets the direction and value. So that's why it is a vector. Um, so dipole moment per, uh, per unit volume is uh, polarization. We denote it polarization by vector uh, P capital. <clears throat> okay, and this P capital vector uh, describes the It describes the process of polarization of a, of a material, and it defines the the density of bound charges in dielectric. Specifically, the divergence of the poly vector polarization is a, a density of bound charges. Okay, and. Uh, being introduced this way, polarization can be added to the vector D. And uh, as a result, we can add this vector to the Maxwell equations. Particularly important parameter here is the electric permittivity, okay, which uh, depends on or connects the uh, electric polarizability, this alpha E, right? So the alpha E, the electric polarizability is a function of frequency uh, that describes how strong the polarization is uh, per um, unit of uh, electric field uh, strengths. Um, 
Yeah, dialectic permittivity. Dialectic permittivity can be very different from several thousands up to just one. Or like uh, vacuum has permittivity of one. Air has permittivity of one point zero 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 something. So very very close to vacuum. Uh, glass has the permittivity of around 2.2, uh, two, et cetera. Uh, if you have the bound charges, right, we can introduce polarization current uh, through the time derivative of polarization. And this polarization current is also added to the uh, Maxwell equation for the curl of magnetic field. Okay, so this current of bound charges uh, cre creates the curl of magnetic field as uh, well as any type of currents, including free currents. Um, <clears throat> so being introduced this way, uh, Dialectic permittivity allows allows us to write down the Maxwell equations for the dialect for a dielectric in a form of Maxwell equation in a free space, but replacing the epsilon zero by epsilon zero times epsilon. Okay, so we uh, the effect of of the dielectric is uh, encapsulated into this uh, parameter epsilon. Um, along with the epsilon, we need to, I mean, uh, we also introduce this parameter refractive index, which is square root of epsilon, because uh, this refractive index, I mean, it's particularly important for, for wave, for um, for calculating or investigating of the wave propagation through medium. Uh, basically, the real part of refractive index, as we discussed, yeah, as we discussed here, <coughs> a, a real part of refractive index <coughs> describes the uh, uh, shrinking of the wave okay so for a given frequency so frequency stays unchanged when the wave comes to the dielectric medium but the wavelength changes because the phase velocity of the wave changes in vacuum it is uh, c right the speed of light in matter in material in in a dielectric the speed of the speed of the wave is uh, reduced by a factor of a real part of a refractive index. Okay. And the uh, imaginary part of refractive index describes the <coughs> decay of amplitude of a wave of a wave in a particular dielectric. So since the dielectric is can be lossy. In reality, we always have some amount of loss, right? So we have this decay of amplitude of wave as it propagates through through the dielectric. Uh, but some materials are anisotropic, okay? And uh, it can be manifested in a fact that this vector d or vector of polarization, polarization vector that appears in the crystal mm -hmm. does not align with the uh, vector of electric field. Oh, give me a second, I have to take this one. Right. Um, yeah, so the fact that some materials can be anisotropic is manifested in the fact that vector of polarization or vector D that is induced in the crystal in a matter, in a crystal, 
uh, does not align with the vector of electric field. Okay, that's why we need to introduce this tensor of uh, dielectric permittivity to take into account the ionisotropy of, of the crystal. Okay. Uh, yeah. And likewise, the magnetics, the, the materials that can be magnetized in the presence of magnetic field, right? They describe by so-called magnetic dipole. In the dielectric, we have electric dipole. In magnetics, we have magnetic dipoles. So magnetic dipoles is a, a quantity that is described by the, uh, again, this vector. Uh, it gets the direction. And uh, it's defined by the current, this uh, circular current or elementary loop of a current. Uh, sometimes we call this magnetron uh, times the the area of of the dipole of of this current. For example, in an atom, it can be the area of orbital, right? So this area of electro electron orbital. Uh, so the the existence of these magnetic dipoles leads to uh, magnetization in a in a in some materials okay and this magnetization likewise polarization is introduced to the maxwell equation through this uh, letter m capital and in order to describe magnetization we can use this magnetic uh, polarizability alpha and uh, uh, magnetic permeability mu <coughs> So did we, yeah, so this mu coefficient is the magnetic uh, uh, permeability and describes the magnetization of some of some materials um, in the presence of magnetic field. And the important point here is that uh, this magnetization process typically much slower than polarization. And uh, that's why at higher frequencies, like in optics, uh, infrared, light, this magnetization does not, does not uh, follow the change of, of the magnetic field. Okay, so if this frequency of magnetic field or electromagnetic field is high, uh, the magnetization does not appear. That's why typically at, free, at optical frequencies, you have no magnetic effects, okay? Uh, in radio frequency and microwaves, of course, we have some materials uh, like ferroids uh, that possess some amount of um, magnetization. Okay, and uh, so we discussed the uh, dielectrics materials without uh, free charges, and, uh, and the next next I, next topic is uh, conductors, as the opposite case of of materials of matter. Mm, so it was lecture eight. Today is lecture number nine. And we start with uh, uh, conductors. So typical example of a conductor is a metal like uh, copper or aluminum, right? So typically these conductors, like metals, they have a large concentration of free charges. Large concentrations of 
<clears throat> of free charges. And the existence of these free charges in the bulk of, of a conductor leads to the fact that uh, these materials get um, currents, recharge currents in uh, in the presence of electric fields. All right, sigma e. <clears throat> Ohm's law in a differential form, the local form, as we discussed. Um, also, we use conductors like metals uh, in order to drive currents using some generators, right? For example, antennas, right? We use antennas to convert. Uh, currents into the electromagnetic fields. So metals also conductors also used uh, for generation of electromagnetic field. And uh, this type of currents of generator, like generator driven currents, will denote by J, uh, stands for the generator. <clears throat> generator driven currents. Okay, and uh, so we assume that uh, the case we consider now, the case of a conductor is a perfect case, meaning that the effect of, of free charges is much, much stronger than the effect of bound charges. So we don't <clears throat> consider the effects of polarizations, polarization for now. And taking and uh, having this in mind, we can write down the, the Maxwell equation for the curl of uh, magnetic field without polarization. Right, but with the effect of uh, free charges, basically, the, with the effect of conductivity. Okay, so let's denote this no polarization, no no polarization. No polarization. <clears throat> So now th um, this equation is fair for any type of time dependence of electric field, electric and magnetic fields. <clears throat> Let us make a assumption that our electric and magnetic fields depend on the time as a harmonic function. So if electric field can be written as the some complex amplitude E to the power of i omega t, right? Then any time derivative of this field will be given by i omega e tilde e omega omega t, <clears throat> right? And the same holds for the for the magnetic field. Um, so let us. Uh, yeah, and of course, this is what we introduced as the electric field, right? So it is equal to I omega E, I omega T, I omega E. Um, all right, so let us rewrite this Maxwell equation uh, for the harmonic field. So it's a curl H equals to I omega epsilon zero E plus sigma E. <clears throat> okay. So now we can uh, take the I omega from the parentheses and also electric field. 
So in the parentheses, it will be epsilon zero plus uh, sigma over i omega e. <clears throat> okay. And uh, let me multiply um, both parts by imaginary unit here and uh, and also take yeah let's also take this epsilon zero from the parentheses so it's gonna be omega epsilon zero then one here minus because i times i is, it gives me minus minus i sigma over omega uh, and epsilon zero e <clears throat> right so this quantity in the parentheses is uh, considered as a uh, some epsilon the or can be considered as some epsilon epsilon but in this case of a metal <clears throat> right the complex complex permittivity complex permittivity of uh, of, a, of of a conductor of uh, conductor okay uh, we can actually write this down mm, as a epsilon c with tilde denoting that this is the uh, complex uh, quantity Epsilon zero omega. <laughs> right. So this is the formula for a general general formula for a con conductor uh, conductor permittivity, uh, and um, we see that the fact that um, I mean the presence of free charges in a conductor in in the metal. Uh, makes the permittivity complex values, right? So this second term here is uh, complex values, obviously, because of this imaginary unit there. Another point here to, to stress is that, is the fact that this sigma, the conductivity, is supposed to be taken at the frequency of, of the field. And of course, it is a frequency dependent function and uh, the value of this conductivity depends on frequency quite significantly and thus far we don't we don't know the formula for this uh, sigma uh, the conductivity as a function of as a function of frequency and uh, yeah so what is sigma omega uh, there are different different models uh, to describe conductors for example metals and the, the one of the most important approaches one of the most important models is the model known as drew the zomerfeld field and i suggest that we <coughs> discuss this drew the zomerfeld field because of its high importance. We consider Drude, Drude, uh, Zammerfeld, Zammerfeld uh, theory <coughs> of metals. Okay. So this theory assumes that the metal can be considered as a 
um, as a cloud of electrons moving in the atom uh, or ion crystal crystalline structure uh, of, a, of a metal and uh, the ions much heavier than the electrons <clears throat> so all the response comes from the electrons which are much uh, lighter and uh, and uh, in the presence of the electric field uh, we can we can emit the effect of uh, of any movement of the crystalline structure <clears throat> right so uh, for this reason we consider uh, first one single electron okay and uh, applied electric field <clears throat> in applied electric field uh, one can use one so considering this problem like a classical problem we can uh, we can use second newton's uh, uh, theorem right uh, equation uh, which describes the force acting on the on the electron as a uh, as a product of mass and uh, and the uh, acceleration of the of the of the electron m times a and uh, on the other hand we know that in the electric field this force is equal to the charge of the electron times the uh, strength of the electric field, E times <coughs> E capital, right? So on the other hand, we know that acceleration is the uh, second derivative of the position of electron by time, okay? And um, what we also need to add here is the uh, is a decay factor, right? Like uh, if if we excite our metal material with the electric field, this electric field causes the electrons to move along the electric field. But when we turn off suddenly the electric field of course the electrons <coughs> will dissipate their energy and stop uh, after a while right and uh, this process must be added to the to the description and we add this dissipation you see patient as a <coughs> as a parameter uh, gamma capital and it's proportional to uh, the total dissipation factor proportional to the velocity of the of the electron. So we add this dissipation as a m times gamma capital. Okay, gamma capital is the decay rate, and times the the first derivative of coordinate by time, which is velocity. Okay. So the resulting equation is uh, m then uh, acceleration dr d2 r d2 plus dissipation factor m gamma dr d2 dt and is equal to the the, uh, the charge times the electric field so now I can divide both parts by m, the mass of the of the electron, <coughs> and make an ansatz. Before that, we assume that assume that electric field is uh, again uh, harmonic function with some amplitude e zero times e to the power of uh, i omega t 
harmonic. The field is a harmonic function and uh, we make ansatz ansatz or assumption that the 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 coordinate of the electron r right is also a harmonic function with some amplitude r0 Okay, so if so, then the the time derivative of the coordinate is equal to i omega r zero e to the power of i omega t. And the second uh, time derivative of the coordinate is equal to minus omega square. Uh, R zero e to the power of i omega t, right? So I plug in these <coughs> ansatz to the uh, to the to the equation, and what I get, I get uh, minus omega squared m, <coughs> then r zero e to the power of i omega t, then plus oh I divided by m. So no m here, plus gamma uh, e omega. So let me put e in the first place, gamma omega uh, r0 e to the power of i omega t is equal to e over m, e0 e to the power of i omega t. Okay, so now I can... Uh, divide both parts by e to the power of i omega t <clears throat> and uh, factorize this r0 on the left side it's going to be minus omega squared plus i gamma omega equal to e over m e0 vector all right, uh, yeah, so let's divide both parts by this uh, parenthesis here. I uh, get R0 equal to E over E over M minus omega square plus uh, E gamma omega times E times E0. So this is the coordinate of the electron as a function of the amplitude of electric fields and uh, as a function of other parameters, including the frequency of the field. <clears throat> now I recall the, the definition of a dipole, of a dipole moment, right? Which is the, which is the charge of the electron times the coordinate of the dipole. Okay, so the for the dipole moment we can write this one, this formula uh, e squared over m minus omega squared plus i gamma omega uh, e <coughs> e zero. So next, the polarization of the unit uh, volume of this metal is given by uh, in this model, it's given by the concentration of, of the electrons times the dipole moment of single electron. Okay, So at this moment, we assume that the electrons uh, don't basically affect each other. So it's a perfect, like a, they behave like a perfect ideal, ideal gas. <laughs> That's why we just we just multiply dipole moment by the concentration. So this n here is a concentration of electrons. Uh, 
uh, per unit of the volume of the, of the of the of the metal. So it allows us to write the formula for the polarization of the <coughs> of the metal. So it's going to be E squared n over m minus omega squared plus i gamma omega e e zero. Uh, so if you recall the formula that connects the polarization and the electric field, it was uh, it was epsilon zero alpha, which is polarizability, electric polarizability times electric field, right? <clears throat> so we conclude that this part and this part must be equal. And from here, I can write the formula for the polarizability as a E squared N over epsilon zero M minus omega squared plus I gamma omega, okay? And finally, I recall the formula for the dielectric primitivity, which is one plus alpha alpha e, <clears throat> right? So the dielectric permittivity of the of the metal is given by one plus e squared m over epsilon zero m minus omega squared plus i gamma omega. <clears throat> so <clears throat> this formula is usually written in a way um, we take this minus here from the denominator in front of this in, in front of this ratio. So let us take this minus from here. So it's gonna be plus here, minus here, and minus and minus here. Okay, so this is the final formula for the permittivity permittivity of <coughs> of uh, let's say through the through the metal um of the through the metal or uh, ideal metal or a metal that is described as a plasma um right so usually people also <clears throat> introduce this uh value of uh, free of plasma frequency so if i denote by plasma frequency squared i denote this uh, this value here uh, so it is E squared N over epsilon zero M, right? So the actual plasma frequency is given by the square root of this. <coughs> square root of this. E squared N over epsilon zero M. Then the formula for the permittivity of a metal will be equal to one minus omega plasma squared over omega squared minus i gamma omega. So this is very well known formula for the dielectric permittivity of, of a metal. Um, so let us look closely on, <coughs> on this formula and first make an assumption of uh, of no losses. So if or without loss, without loss, without losses or gamma capital equal to zero, right? So no losses, no dissipation. This formula gives us one minus uh, omega plasma squared over, over omega squared. So this is the dielectric primitivity 
as a function of frequency, right? And uh, if we plot this uh, permittivity as a function of frequency, we would get something like like this. This is uh, angular frequency. <coughs> this is our epsilon, right? So if omega is equal to omega plasma, then this ratio is equal to one and the epsilon is equal to zero. So it intersects the uh, like x axis in the in the point of plasma plasma frequency right and um, and the curve this dependence goes like goes like this hmm. let me let me draw it like like this <clears throat> okay so this is omega plasma <clears throat> when the frequency is very large then this ratio goes to uh, zero and the epsilon uh, uh, tends to one right so this is square one but when frequency is very small then the ratio is very large and negative. So at low frequency, the epsilon of a metal uh, goes to minus infinity. Mm, let us write this like this. So if uh, omega is much smaller than omega plasma, Epsilon is uh, large and uh, negative. And this is quite important because this allows metals to basically reflect waves. Uh, it allows to like mirrors to work, <clears throat> etc. The fact that Epsilon is very large and uh, and negative. Uh, why? Because in this case, uh, when we have no losses, <clears throat> no losses, and uh, the energy uh, cannot dissipate, right? So no dissipation in this case. But still, if I consider the wave number, which is omega over C n by by definition right or omega over c square root of epsilon <clears throat> if epsilon is uh, negative right so if epsilon is negative i can write it like square root of modulus epsilon minus modulus epsilon right and this is equal to imaginary unit times square root of modulus epsilon okay so the uh, harmonic wave like or plane wave uh, which is described by this phase factor phase term e to the power of i k z right it uh, will give me e to the power of minus because imaginary unit times imaginary unit gives me minus one so it's going to be minus omega over c square root of modulus epsilon times <coughs> times z so it's a exponentially decay in amplitude uh, and uh, uh, and the wave that propagates in metal uh, decays uh, in amplitude well, let me exponentially let me draw this like like this for example sketch so for example i have a piece of metal like this 
with the boundary here. Okay, this is the z coordinate, z coordinate, and uh, so my wave uh, is coming to this metal, <clears throat> and uh, and this solution basically means that the wave in the metal uh, decays exponentially in amplitude like this. Okay, so this is exponential exponent decay. <coughs> For real metals, this exponential decay is very, very fast. Uh, because since modulus epsilon, absolute value of epsilon depends on the plasma frequency and plasma frequency is def defined by the square root of uh, concentration of electrons. And since the concentration of electrons is, uh, is huge and typically huge in metals, this exponential decay happens like very fast <clears throat> for uh, metals like uh, silver, uh, this um, penetration depth, okay, or also known as the skin layer, skin layer or skin depth, uh, is equal to like a few tens of nanometers. So typically, like in optics, typically, oops. Uh, let's say 100 nanometers, something like this. So very, <clears throat> very quickly, the the field inside of the metal uh, decays in amplitude. And but with but without dissipation, <clears throat> because for now we consider the case of of no losses. Okay, so the wave dissipate the decays in amplitude but without dissipation. And uh, where is the energy then? It reflects back uh, like this. So it bounces off from the, from the boundary of, of the metal. Uh, so this, this <coughs> field with exponential decay and uh, uh, without dissipation, let's say, uh, field with exponential decay, but not due to the losses, not due to the dissipation, but the fact that epsilon is uh, is negative. So this field is also known as um, evanescent, evanescent field. Evanescent field. <coughs> Um, so we we've got uh, the formula for the for the epsilon as a function of frequency, and we also have this formula for the the initial one for the epsilon as a function of uh, sigma, as a function of conductivity. <clears throat> so we can compare the both now and derive the formula for the, for the conductivity. Okay, so the one for uh, the epsilon as a function of uh, conductivity is equal to one minus uh, imaginary unit uh, sigma, over epsilon zero omega. The second one, the the one the, through the plasma frequency is one minus omega plasma over omega squared minus i gamma omega. Right, <clears throat> gamma omega. So from these two, <coughs> We conclude that the i omega i sigma over epsilon zero omega is equal to 
omega plus of squared over omega square minus i gamma omega. So let us uh, isolate the sigma here, which is function of frequency, right? So the sigma is equal to omega zero, then omega over i <coughs> times plasma frequency squared over omega squared minus i gamma omega. <coughs> so one omega cancel. And I also recall the formula for the, <coughs> for the plasma frequency, which is e squared n over epsilon zero e squared n over epsilon zero m. Uh, and I noticed that the epsilon zero cancel down. And uh, and what I what I get <coughs> in result is gonna be e squared n over m uh, imaginary unit over omega minus I gamma. <laughs> I can multiply this imaginary unit uh, on omega and minus I gamma, right? So I get uh, plus here and imaginary imaginary unit here. <clears throat> um, let me take this gamma out. It's going to be e squared n over m gamma capital and here i have left one over one plus i omega <coughs> one i mean i and and gamma of course and uh, over gamma all right so <coughs> this quantity is known as the uh, uh, conductivity at DC, the constant current conductivity, um, sigma, sigma zero. And finally, the final formula for the, from the conductivity as a function of frequency is equal to conductivity <coughs> for the direct current, zero frequency conductivity over one plus i omega over over gamma okay so this is the formula for the conductivity of a metal as a function of as a function of frequency <clears throat> this sigma zero uh, depends on the concentration of electrons and uh, and the decay factor this gamma capital and uh, which can be um, deduced or measured from the from, from the experiment, and uh, yeah, and these values are of course well known for for the most of the materials. So this way we we derive the we we use the conductivity of a metal, and again, in the presence of the electric field, such metal with such a conductivity uh, gets the current density, uh, which, do, which uh, uh, defined by, by this formula. 
<clears throat> All right, so this is uh, this is about about metals. Do you have any questions about this part? Yes, professor. Mm -hmm. Yes, go ahead. Uh, just for clarification, uh, this lab you you were talking about uh, the the rate decay that that is uh, equal zero. So uh, after that you. I mean, you clarify the in the in the plot uh, that uh, as as high in the frequency than the the approximation of, of of the epsilon goes to one, but uh, now you now you jump to this new formula when the rate decay is not zero anymore. Are are you then? Talking about two types of wave decay. <clears throat> wave decay. So let me let me, let me repeat. So from the Drudes uh, approach, drew from the basically from from the classical mechanic description of of the of the metal, we derive this formula for the permittivity of a of a of a metal. Right, and uh, then we introduce this uh, quantity of uh, plasma frequency, and this allows us to write this formula like in a very simple form. <clears throat> so next, why this quantity is known as plasma frequency? So that's actually because uh, from the experiment, uh, it is known that the metals. Uh, start uh, or became transparent mm. after some after some frequency, and this frequency is known as plasma frequency. And uh, uh, this parameter was derived even before mm -hmm. the theory of a metal. So some metals, actually all the metals, they become transparent uh, above uh, some frequency known as plasma frequency and indeed uh, the, for the frequencies below plasma frequency the epsilon is uh, negative and this negative epsilon uh, makes the this phase phase factor uh, decaying right so this factor became decaying because the epsilon is negative this is not dissipation. This is just the fact that uh, wave reflects from the metal, and of course dissipates in the in the bulk of the metal. Um, and uh, above plasma frequency, when epsilon becomes positive, positive uh, it gets positive amplitude, <coughs> positive value. Uh, Above plasma frequency, uh, we have wave propagation through through the metal. Okay, of course we have we also have some reflection and some uh, a part of the wave reflects, part of the wave uh, propagates through the metal. <clears throat> but this effect of propagation of the electromagnetic wave through the metal uh, only can. Uh, happens above the plasma frequency. Uh, so, so far we, I mean, until this point or all this is fair when gamma is equal to zero. Of course, if gamma <coughs> gets some value when gamma capital is not equal to zero, this leads, it leads only to the fact that the epsilon gets both uh, real and imaginary parts. And we have, and since epsilon gets imaginary part, we start having the uh, dissipation of the wave. Okay, so in the general case, the wave, when wave bounce off or reflects from the metal, 
it <clears throat> decays due to the uh, due to the reflection. Okay, below the plasma frequency, and on top of that, we also have this process of dissipation due to the uh, due to the gamma capital, <clears throat> due to the uh, turning the energy into the heat into the loss. Um. Yeah. So and yeah, after I, that, yeah. mm -hmm. I understood. I understood that the the the, the composition of the metal determines the the yeah. reflection. And okay. uh, if, 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 if there is uh, uh, enough uh, uh, reflection, then uh, it can it, it can goes back uh, easier. Uh, okay. Uh, <clears throat> yes. Easier. Yeah, absolutely. Do you have any other questions? No, no. Not if me. not, okay. Um. I mean, maybe other other guys, other peers. Do you have any questions, guys? Okay, if not, then let me quickly go through the boundary conditions because uh, this is the last theoretical part, the last uh, part of the theoretical introduction. And then I was planning to start showing you the uh, <clears throat> the numerical simulations uh, for the for this for the simple case of uh, of the electrostatic and magnetostatic okay so this is i guess chapter 3.2 3.2 and let's denote it by name it by uh, boundary bound boundary conditions Mm. <clears throat> and for simplicity, let's derive them without without uh, uh, surface charges and surface currents. Without, without charges and currents. Because uh, essentially this is the only case we will need or we will use. <clears throat> okay, so boundary conditions. Um, <clears throat> so, so we discussed free, uh, um, the electromagnetic field in free space. We discussed the different cases of, uh, of a matter. And uh, in reality, of course, uh, this, uh, the, the the matter the materials they have some boundaries right the surfaces and these materials they immersed in the free space and uh, all the systems uh, they uh, contain they consist of different parts and uh, these um, uh, the these parts they have the boundaries right the boundaries that <clears throat> uh, between the between the parts uh, and uh, when wave propagates from one part of the system to another part uh, something happens to the electric and magnetic field at the boundary okay and uh, now we're gonna figure out what actually happens at the at the boundary and of course, in order to derive these boundary conditions, we will use the Maxwell equations, but in the uh, in the integral form. So basically, we have four Maxwell equations, and we're gonna derive the four uh, boundary conditions. So let's start with the uh, the Maxwell equations for the curl of electric field. It's equal to minus dB over dt. Right. And, uh, and uh, if I integrate this equation 
by the some arbitrary surface. Some arbitrary surface. <clears throat> um, I would get something like this, right? This is something that we already discussed several times. <clears throat> and uh, the integral of the curl of some field uh, over some uh, over some surface is equal to the field circulation around the around the boundary of this of this uh, uh, of this surface, right? So it's gonna be. Something like this. And uh, this integral gives me the uh, flux of magnetic field, phi uh, b. OK. So in the integral form, this Maxwell equation reads the circulation of electric field over the, <clears throat> over the closed uh, Path and is equal to minus d uh, phi over dt. Okay, so and that mm, maybe just uh, remind you. So I have some uh, field in the in the space, and I introduce the uh, auxiliary surface like this. In this case, it's a not closed surface, <clears throat> not closed area. And this is what we denote by S in this in this formulas. Okay. And this area gets the the edge, the boundary over here. And this is what we denote by L here <clears throat> right so the this theorem this integral theorem states that the uh, flux of the curl of electric field is equal to uh, first is equal to the circulation of uh, electric field around this edge around this path and on the other hand, it's equal to the uh, change of the flux of the magnetic field uh, through this area. Okay. <clears throat> so now I consider the boundary between two uh, materials like this. Um, and uh, let's say the upper material gets parameters epsilon 1 mu 1 and the lower gets parameters epsilon 2 mu 2 okay so two different different materials and i have electric field in this space like this and i'm asking like uh, what happens to this electric field when it goes from one material to another material Okay, so uh, I can mm, um, decompose this electric field into two parts, into the normal component of the field. This is E normal <clears throat> and the tangential component of the field. So this is E tangential. Okay, so now I want to use this formula above and derive the first boundary condition. So in order to use this formula, I need to introduce the integration path and it's supposed to be the closed loop, closed integration loop like this, okay. Uh, 
I denote the length of this figure by L and the, and the width of this by um, delta, delta like this. <clears throat> okay, so the circulation, right? This uh, integral E dl, now it consists of four parts <clears throat> of going uh, in the normal direction twice and uh, going to the tangential uh, direction also twice, uh, forward and backwards. So it's gonna be, uh, let us denote this paths by maybe one, two, three, and four, right? So it's equal to <clears throat> E times, so for the first for the first path, the first one is uh, uh, normal, and uh, this one is denote is given by the normal component of the electric field times delta, which is the length of this path, right? Then plus the second the second uh, the second part of this path is uh, tangential. So it's given by the tangential component of the field in the first um, material, in the upper material, times L, the length of this path, uh, plus, <coughs> so actually minus because uh, the direction matters. So I denote the direction of around this path like, uh, clockwise, so the, I, I go around this path in the clockwise direction, okay? So it's gonna be minus E normal times delta, and finally minus E tangential two times L, and it's gonna be equal to minus D over DT of the flux of magnetic field. <coughs> Right, so I have electric field, and of course I have, or might have the, the magnetic field, and uh, the total the total circulation of the electric field is given by the change of the of the magnetic of the flux of the magnetic field in time. So now I make the typical assumption that delta goes to zero, delta vanishes. And since the delta vanishes, the area, this area of this uh, auxiliary path, of the auxiliary surface, auxiliary area is also vanishes. And for this reason, for this reason, also the flux of magnetic field also goes to zero, also vanishes. <coughs> okay, and what I have left, I have left only the uh, tangential component of electric field times L minus tangential component of electric field times L is equal to zero. I divide both parts by L, then conclude that the tangential component of the electric field in the first medium is equal to the tangential component of the electric field in the second medium. And this is the general result. Always fair, uh, depending on the presence of other charges, etc. <clears throat> so the tangential component of electric field is continuous. Like in a, in any case, in any general uh, system. The tangential component of electric field is, is continuous. Uh, and the, as a consequence of this, uh, for example, if we recall the uh, fact that the electric field uh, can be considered to be zero in the magnet in the in the metal, right? This is something that we just discussed. <coughs> the uh, 
electric field of a uh, of a wave decays very fast in the in the material in in the metal and uh, in just a few tens of nanometers the field is is zero right so if i consider this boundary to be like the layer with the thickness of few tens of nanometers which is extremely thin layer then i conclude that in a metal the field including tangential component is equal to zero right and at the same time it means that the tangential component uh, outside of the metal right at the boundary also equal to zero also vanishes and uh, yeah so the any wave that uh, bounces off the metal it gets the node here so zero field at the boundary of a metal uh, for, for, for this reason all right <clears throat> so this is the <clears throat> this is the first uh, boundary condition second one the second boundary condition we derive this from the formula for the derivative of vector d and it's equal to the <clears throat> to the uh, density of uh, free charges <clears throat> so for now we assume that density of free charges is zero so the derivative of uh, sorry divergence of uh, vector d is equal to zero okay and uh, if i integrate uh, if i integrate the uh, this by some volume right what i get i get the integral divergence of d over the volume so now i'm using the divergence integral theorem so i represent this integral through the <coughs> through the um, flux of the vector d over the surface of this volume, the closed surface, okay? And the integral of the, uh, I mean, of the zero is zero, okay? So it's uh, equal to zero. So the total flux of d uh, is equal to, through, through, the, through the area, without charges is equal to zero okay so now i'm gonna use this <clears throat> this formula and uh, again consider the boundary between two materials but now i'm right i'm drawing this in perspective like like this okay so the upper material gets epsilon one mu one the lower one is epsilon two mu two Okay, and I consider the elementary uh, uh, integration surface <clears throat> in the form of a cylinder with the upper base, the lower base, and the side and the side surface over here. Okay. And again, I have the uh, the component of electric field normal to the surface is a normal field, and some tangential field that goes through the <clears throat> through the side area e tangential. The height of this mm, of this integration surface integration area is uh, equal to delta okay and um, and i use this formula above so what i get i get uh, for the for the upper base and lower base i i get uh, uh, d normal one times um <coughs> times uh 
S1, right? S1 is this area of this uh, upper upper base area of the of the cylinder. Since the upper surface area is uh, equal to the lower one, so we denote it by just S. Uh, minus dn2 times s and plus some um, term that depends on the flux of the vector d through the side area. So it's a side area flux. <laughs> and the result is equal to zero. So now since, or so now I vanish the uh, delta. So I make this, mm, this cylinder shorter and shorter and bring the bases closer and closer. And so this side area vanishes. Side area vanishes. And hence I came to the conclusion that the normal component, the normal component of the vector D is uh, continuous. D1, Dn1 is equal to Dn2. And if I recall the formula, the, the formula for the D, right? So the D is uh, equal to epsilon zero epsilon E. Right, so I conclude that the epsilon one e normal one is equal to epsilon two e normal two. So this is the second boundary condition. So in contrast to the tangential component of electric field, normal component of electric field <coughs> is not continuous. It changes by the factor of, I mean, of the change of epsilon from one material to another material. Okay, so the third boundary condition for the uh, third Maxwell equation for the curl of magnetic field is equal to d d over dt oh well plus the current but we assume we assume no current okay uh, and again this uh, formula by integrating over the auxiliary surface can be rewritten in this form <coughs> over a circulation of magnetic field over the edge of this auxiliary surface is equal to is equal to the uh, time derivative of the uh, flux of vector of vector d. Okay, and again, if I consider the um, the boundary between two materials like this. Or maybe you know, let me draw this in a different way to make it more tidy. Okay, so this is the area. I again introduce the integration path like this with the delta to be the height of this uh, of this figure, we L for the for the lengths. <clears throat> right, and uh, <clears throat> and I again tend this uh, delta to to zero. So what I get, I get the fact that the first of all the the um, uh, the flux of the vector d through the surface also vanishes because the area of this figure vanishes of this uh, auxiliary area vanishes okay and i come to the similar conclusion that the tangential component of the magnetic field 
is also is also continuous. <clears throat> and finally, for the first one, <clears throat> for the first one, the the last equation for the um, uh, flux of the of the magnetic field. It's equal to zero because of no magnetic charges in 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 nature. We use this, I mean, for for the same equation, but for the electric field D, right? We've got this conclusion that the normal component of the electric field is continuous. Here is, I mean, the derivation is exactly the same. So let me write the the final result that states that the normal component of the magnetic field b continues across the boundary or for the <coughs> for the h field it states that the magnetic permeability one times h normal one is equal to magnetic permeability two times h normal two uh, so they two are the same, uh, they are equal. Okay. So this is the first uh, boundary condition. Uh, again, the, the boundary conditions three and four, they, they fair for uh, the case of no uh, free charges, no currents, at the surface, but typically it is uh, it is the case. So that's why I'm, I derive this in uh, in this form. Um, do you have any questions about the boundary conditions? <clears throat> so if not, let me then. Uh, write down the Maxwell equations uh, in the most general case, as we know them already, and make several maybe conclusions about this. So uh, Maxwell equations in the most, in the most, general uh, form. Well, the most general form you can find in the books on theoretical physics and uh, yeah, here I'm talking about general form in the in the in the way we will use them or people used for uh, <clears throat> solving, uh, electromagnetic uh, um, problems, either analytically or numerically. Right, so the first one states that the, the divergence of magnetic field is equal to zero, right? Second one states that the divergence of the vector D is equal to the uh, charge density of the free charges and of course this charge density is a function of coordinate and it can be the function of of time as well we also know the connection between the vector d and vector e epsilon zero epsilon e right <laughs> and we also know the connection between vector d and vector polarization it is epsilon e, oh, sorry, epsilon zero e plus vector p, vector polarization. So the third uh, equation is equation for the curl of electric field. It is given by minus db over dt. And here we have this vector b. So the vector B is connected to the uh, connected with the vector H through this formula mu zero mu H. 
And vector B is uh, caused by the magnetization, M, and also given by this formula uh, that connects it with the magnetization, plus M magnetization. So you see this duality between electric fields and magnetic fields. Uh, in, the case, in the case of electric field, we have permittivity, electric permittivity. In the case of magnetic field, we have magnetic permeability. In the case of electric field, we have the polarization vector. In the case of magnetic field, we have magnetization vector. <coughs> Uh, but this, all these things are very like uh, similar, and um, and the fourth uh, equation is the one for the curl of uh, magnetic field, H, is given by minus d, uh, d d over d t plus sigma e, which is the uh, free charge <coughs> currents, uh, right? Plus the uh, also possible currents of the um, of the generators from generators. So this is the uh, gene generator driven current. Um. <clears throat> Yeah, so this is what we know so far, plus the boundary conditions, plus the um, uh, some information about the material parameters, epsilon and mu. For example, uh, epsilon for the metal is given by this Drude formula. Uh, for example, uh, there are other approaches to epsilon of a metal, uh, dielectrics uh, also can have the dispersion, meaning that epsilon also can be a function of frequency. <clears throat> and uh, sometimes materials have material resonance and uh, at the material resonance, the epsilon gets also the resonant behavior. It's uh, suddenly, uh, grows up uh, and uh, and also losses are increased at the resonance mm. what else the magnetic effects in optics uh, vanish uh, but uh, at microwaves and refract and uh, radio waves the uh, there are some materials with uh, finite magnetization and magnetic effects <clears throat> and uh, so maybe let me bring one example just maybe to illustrate the the effect of different currents um, oh <clears throat> example that I am typically uh, I typically consider so let me consider a generator can be some sort of a ref generator. And this generator through a coaxial cable drives currents in a antenna, like this dipole, dipole antenna. Okay. <clears throat> so these currents over the dipole antenna, this is something that is denoted by this uh, uh, JG, this uh, density current of generator. So we have this density current of, of the generator. And typically it's fixed. Uh, this type of current is de de defined by the properties of the generator. <clears throat> okay, so if this current uh, oscillates in time. Uh, this oscillation of the current, of course, creates electromagnetic fields. As we discussed, these electromagnetic fields, they can exist in the, in the space without the charges and currents and propagate through the uh, area around. 
because the electric and magnetic fields have some certain phase delay, right? It's basically zero. So the uh, phase difference between electric field oscillations and magnetic field oscillations equal to zero. This makes the electromagnetic field uh, propagating in space. Okay, so now let us assume that we have some body in this in this area <coughs> like this. So this is the some dielectric um, some dielectric object, dielectric yeah. some dielectric object with some epsilon with some permittivity value. So this <coughs> object, this dielectric object, uh, gets polarized because of the presence of the electric field from the antenna, right? And uh, it gets this current uh, JP, polarization current, which is equal to the time derivative of polarization over, over time, okay? And uh, of course, this <coughs> polarization current also oscillates in time uh, uh, as well as the, the field that causes this uh, polarization current to appear. And this polarization current re <coughs> radiates the electromagnetic field uh, also in all basically directions, something like this, including direction towards the antenna back like this. And of course, the field propagating in the in the free space, even in the vacuum, as we discussed, we also can assign the particular special current to this progress, to this to this process, right? So it was the displacement current in our in our discussions it was displacement current and it's given by epsilon zero and time derivative of the uh, electric field in in free space right so the propagation of the electric or electromagnetic field in, in in free space also can be considered as a uh, current <clears throat> and it's known as the displacement current. Okay, and finally, this electromagnetic field that is re-radiated by the electric dielectric object, or again can cause the current in the metallic parts of the antenna, right? And this is would be the current of free charges. Which is equal to sigma, uh, uh, sigma e, the product of the conductivity and the <coughs> conductivity of the metallic parts of this antenna uh, times electric field in the present in the in the position of this of this antenna, something like this. Yeah. So how many currents we have? The uh, generator current displacement current, polarization current, and the con conduction current. So it's uh, <clears throat> four types of, uh, different, of different currents. Um, yeah, and there is uh, another one possible if this dielectric could be magnetizable, right? Uh, then magnetization, so then it can get the magnetization and this change of magnetization and time again can be considered as a appearance of the of another one of the fifth uh, current in the system known as the magnetization current. All right, so this is pretty much it about the uh, about the theoretical introduction to the electromagnetic theory and Maxwell equations. <clears throat> In what follows, we will discuss the uh, um, uh, different, 
how to say, different uh, cases, uh, starting from the uh, electrostatic, magnetostatic, and uh, low frequency. And we will end by the high frequency uh, cases in, later in this in this course. So do you have any questions regarding this part? If not, let me <laughs> let me start the uh, chapter four. Chapter four. <clears throat> now let me call this static and low frequency fields. Static <clears throat> and uh, low frequency fields. <clears throat> static and low frequency fields. <clears throat> so few words. Few words about static, and then I believe we still have some time to run some first simulations today. And uh, next time, next week, we will we will continue this part. So the static field. So what is static field? <clears throat> so the static field is a field that doesn't depend on time, right? So in my uh, in the Maxwell equations, I simply assume that these uh, time derivatives of electric field and magnetic field equal to equal to zero so no time dependence of of the electric and magnetic fields at the same time it means that the quantity the the frequency either angular frequency omega or the linear frequency which is connected to the angular one <coughs> through this simple formula 2 pi times f, f is the linear frequency, also equal to zero, right? So no oscillation of the field. The oscillation of the field is, uh, no oscillation of the, of the field uh, means that the frequency of this oscillation is equal to zero. And uh, on the other hand, the lambda, which is the wavelength of the field uh, is given by this uh, ratio of the uh, of the speed of light over the frequency of the field uh, is uh, what it is. It's infinity, right? Because if f is equal to zero, then wavelength is infinity. Infin infinity. So essentially, no change of the. Uh, no wave propagation of the field because the wavelength is uh, infinitely large. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> so, assuming the uh, or uh, vanishing the time derivatives of electric and uh, of electric and magnetic field allows us to write down the Maxwell equations for this static for the static case. So the divergence of magnetic field is zero. Divergence of ele elect electric field is uh, rho. <coughs> the uh, charge density of the of electric charges, the curl of electric field is equal to zero. So no no current of no curl of electric field. And uh, and finally, the curl of magnetic field is given by this uh, sigma zero, the conductivity at zero frequency times electric field, which is static, plus possible uh, some generator generator currents, right? Which is also uh, zero frequency current or DC current. So from this equation, uh, 
the curl of electric field, which is equal to zero, uh, we can we can write down or mm, so if the curl of electric field is equal to zero, it means that we can represent the electric field as a gradient or in our case minus gradient of some scalar function phi. Okay, <clears throat> so you remember that uh, the uh, curl of any gradient fin field is equal to zero. <clears throat> uh, and uh, when we have the case of, uh, when, we, when we deal with a field, uh, the curl of which is equal to zero, then we can represent this field as a gradient of some scalar field, scalar, scalar function phi and this scalar function phi is uh, known as the scalar potential phi is scalar potential <clears throat> all right um scalar potential <clears throat> and now i gonna use this uh another equation for the uh, derivative or the divergence of the vector d, which is, by the way, epsilon zero epsilon e equal to the uh, charge density. So now I assume that the epsilon is a constant as it typically is at the zero frequency the static field then the divergence of electric field is equal to one over epsilon zero epsilon rho okay and now i substitute this i plug in this formula for the electric field into this formula and i recall that the divergence of the gradient is equal to the laplacian it's going to be minus uh, Nabla squared or Laplacian of the potential is equal to one over epsilon zero epsilon rho, right? I multiply both parts by minus one and get this simple formula, <clears throat> simple formula here. So some of you recognize the Poissonian, Poissonian equation, right? Poissonian, Poisson, 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 Poisson equation. Poisson equation. <clears throat> For the scalar potential of the of the electric field, which is much easier to solve because scalar field is just gets just one component com in contrast to the electric field. <laughs> which is free, free component field. And then solving this equation for the, uh, for the scalar potential, if you need the electric field, you just take the gradient of this and you get the, you get the electric field. Right, so this is how typically the, uh, the electric field is calculated um, <clears throat> well, for example, for the, in the numerical simulations. So let us, let me now uh, share my screen and uh, show you the ANSYS uh, HFSS <coughs> simulator. The simulator that we are gonna use in the rest of the, of the course. Let me run it on my uh, site. <clears throat> and we're gonna quickly run one simple simulation just to uh, start this this part. Right, so do you, do you see this uh, window of answers el electronics desktop? Yes, we can see that. Okay, awesome. Yeah. All right. So 
yeah, this is answers um, electronic desktop um, or answers HFSS software. This is the software we're going to use for the numerical simulations in this course. Um, <clears throat> so this system, this, this soft is available for you in the computer class. So if you go to the to the canvas and uh, check for the for the number, I mean for the room number, uh, uh, it is the computer class. So if you go there, uh, you can use any computer and uh, each of them gets these uh, answers, HFSS software. So you can start practicing this part. Uh, and we also will do the lab works together in the in the in the class using this system. But today, let me just quickly <clears throat> uh, show you how, for example, how would you solve numerically this uh, electrostatic problem that we just discussed, right? So, as you get to this answers electronic desktop system or environment, <clears throat> first you click here, this Maxwell, and uh, it provides several solvers for the Maxwell equations. <clears throat> and uh, by default, it's Maxwell 3D, Maxwell 3D design. So it allows you to solve the Maxwell equations in, the, in 3D, right? So uh, as you get to this, to this uh, program, to this solver, uh, it shows this uh, area, right, with the <coughs> with the coordinate system x, y, and z, the Cartesian coordinate system. So the first we do is we select the um, solution type. We go to this Maxwell three D, click the solution type. And for now, we need this electrostatic. It gets uh, how many? Four, uh, seven, <clears throat> seven uh, different solvers or solution types. We choose the electrostatic one. Okay, so electrostatic, uh, save <clears throat> the project somewhere. Um, then first, we, I draw the, <clears throat> the structure. And my structure gonna be just a small uh, dielectric uh, <coughs> sphere uh, charged with uh, some charge. Okay, so I, I click this sphere here in the in the drawings, then set the origin or the center of the sphere to the center of the coordinate system and give it some radius and click it again. So it gives me this uh, nicely looking sphere. Then if I double click this sphere parameters, it allows me to get the value of the radius of the sphere. I can parameterize this one, but for now, let me just assign it some number, for example, 10 millimeters. So one centimeter radius sphere. <coughs> okay. So this is my my sphere. Uh, so the next what I do, I create the region around this sphere. So I click here and then choose uh, absolute offset. <coughs> so the absolute offset is the some area around this sphere, some empty space basically. And I give it some number, maybe 100 millimeters. Okay, 100 millimeters. And it draws me this uh, cubic shaped uh, area with my center, uh, with my sphere in the center of this, <clears throat> of this cube. Um, so what's next? <clears throat> next, I... Uh, I need to charge the sphere with some charge. So I select the sphere and then I right click on the 
on the window and um, navigate to assign excitation. So in the um, electrostatic problem, this charge is uh, <clears throat> given as the excitation. Okay, so assign excitation and then charge. <clears throat> uh, then charge. So for the charge, I put something like one Coulomb, uh, just arbitrary number. Okay, so one, one plus one Coulomb. <clears throat> okay. Uh, so when I added the charge, uh, this charge appears in this project manager here in the excitations. Okay, and if I click, it shows me that this uh, sphere is uh, charged. Uh, then I select region and then <clears throat> and then I uh, this part is tricky. Let me uh, yeah, extend selection and I extend all object faces, click here. And then it allows me to, <clears throat> to apply the, uh, well, the another, another excitation, <clears throat> which is in this case, which is the, uh, I mean, basically the boundary condition. So I want to uh, ensure that the, electric field or voltage at this uh, area around uh, at this boundary is equal to zero. So I again assign the excitation and then voltage. Okay. And then voltage zero. So I make this, um, <coughs> this area, this surface like a uh, infinitely uh, distant area, uh, so I ensure the potential to be equal to zero at the boundary of this, at the surface of this area. Okay, so this is the this is the voltage source, and it also appears in these excitations here. Okay, so I have the structure, I have the boundary condition, <coughs> and I have the particle charged. What I need to assign also is this analysis. So I right click the analysis here and add solution setup. And for the solution setup, I change the percent, percent error to be at least 0 0.1. Uh, and maximum number of passes, passes 10 is 10 is fine, 10 is okay. All right. And then I need to <clears throat> maybe, so I can also change the mesh. So we will discuss this more, but uh, this numerical simulation, uh, basically how it works, it, uh, the program discretizes the all volume in the simulation uh, uh, area. Uh, by small uh, cells, and these small cells, they know as mesh cells, okay? And then the program <clears throat> calculates the fields in all these mesh cells and then basically combines the, combines the results in the way they, they are consistent from cell to cell. All right, so we can, here we can refine the mesh, we can make it better, uh, so the result is like more reliable or we can make it uh, more rough and uh, improve the um, simulation time, for example. So let me like improve this mesh just a little. Okay. And then before running simulation, I click this validate button. It shows all uh, green. <clears throat> marks, meaning that the project is ready to be executed. And uh, then I 
To do so, I click this analyze all. And it runs the simulation. So I assign 10 passes. So it's gonna be 10 uh, passes here. Each pass, mm, <clears throat> let me, so I go to the results and sol solution data. While it's simulating, I can here, I can plot the energy error, for example, and I, and I can see in the real time how this um, project converges. Okay, so as the energy error gets smaller and smaller, <clears throat> it allows me to basically deduce the um, convergence of the, of the project. So this energy error, basically, um, it controls the um, uh, energy conservation law. Okay, so the smaller this number, the better, uh, the better convergence. Okay, so meanwhile, the project is uh, executed, the simulation is done, and now I can, for example, tell the program what kind of uh, result I want to see. And as a result, let me, for example, show up the field in this x, y plane. So I go to planes and uh, select this global x, y plane, and then right click on the window, on the main window, on the main field, and go navigate to the fields, and choose the magnitude of electric field. Done. Okay, so this is the uh, electric field, magnitude of the electric field around my charged sphere. Okay, <clears throat> I can do similar, similar things, for example, for the YZ plane, uh, but let me this time show up the vector fields in this plane, like, like this. Okay, so now I have this charge sphere. I can show up the electric field distribution around the sphere in the vector form. I can show up the electric field distribution in the, as a magnitude in the density plot uh, form. Uh, we can also change the, the type of this presentation, right? Like, for example, this one looks nice. Uh, random is uh, uh, rainbow is um, like a more standard form of presentation of the field. I can change the scale, of course. Uh, for example, I can use these limits, and uh, so for example, I don't like these big uh, arrows, red arrows, which is because of the mistake of the simulation of the simulation uh, arrow. If I improve the mesh, I would get rid of these uh, large arrows here. Uh, but I can also change these numbers to, to get rid of them. I don't know, maybe something like, <coughs> it's too much, uh, something like this. Oops, still too much. Yeah, so now it looks like more or less uh, symmetric, right? I can add another plane, of course. Oh, for example, this one. Let me add another uh, density plot, the magnitude of the electric field. Okay, so now I see this like a uh, nice representation of the field around the sphere. <clears throat> Uh, what else? Let me also add an integration line or auxiliary line. Uh, how I do so? <clears throat> yeah, here. I navigate to this draw line, select the draw line, and draw the line from the center of the uh, sphere all the way to the, to the, to the boundary here, okay? like and double click. <clears throat> so I draw the line 
and this line appears in this uh, in the in the model uh, structure. So now I again uh, no uh, now I go to results and and select this fields report and choose this 2D representation. Okay, so here it allows me to choose the geometry. <clears throat> and as a geometry, I choose this uh, line that I just drew, this poly polylined one. And as a result, I plot the magnitude of this of this electric field. New report. Okay, and it gives me the <clears throat> the result. So first, the field linearly grows <clears throat> until the surface of the particle, and then it decays as a factor of uh, distance, one over distance squared, okay? So this is the exactly the result we saw analytically uh, several weeks ago. We, <coughs> we solved this problem uh, using the, uh, using the, uh, this, um, this flux theorem for the electric field. Okay, we solve this in the inside of the particle and, and got the result that the electric field is proportional to the radius of the particle. Not, not the radius, it's proportional to the distance from the center of the particle to the, uh, to the radius. Okay, so it's exactly a linear dependence. And then outside of the particle, uh, it decays as a factor of one over distance squared. This is exactly <clears throat> what we uh, expected to get from the analytical solution. Here we got these results as a, as a numerical result. Of course, this result is not like perfect because for example, we have some, uh, some nonlinear dependence here, for example, uh, nonlinear dependence here also, right? And um, et cetera. That's of course, because of the numerical <clears throat> numerical accuracy. If I improve the mesh, if I put more uh, simulation passes and, uh, and more importantly, if I put, if I change this, uh, this, uh, error, the simulation error to 0 0.01, for example, the, the simulation result will be improved. All right, so this is pretty much it for today. Next time, next week, we're gonna continue the discussion of different aspects of numerical simulation of the fields uh, starting from the uh, low low frequency fields, and then we will discuss the high frequency fields, including the the aspects of wave uh, scattering and uh, wave radiation. And then at some point we will also start doing the um, uh, lab works. So for now, let me. What is it? Yeah, stop the sharing and stop the recording. Thank you very much. And then we can discuss if you have any questions. Okay. Let me stop.